Oh, nee. Hm? All good? I don't know if my microphone works, does it? Yes. No? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So I take that one. Good. Well, first, thank you uh, for coming here, listening to me. Um, you can't escape anymore. But the intensity of the talks we just had, I think, actually, I would like to tell you, stand up and do it. Um, but um, y again, you have to survive this talk first. Um, so when I was asked actually to present here, I realized that I had never done any talk in Berlin. So I've been talking about this model, Lizara, um, funding startups before, but it was always somewhere else. And I thought, okay, how weird is that? I need to do it in Berlin because there are so many people who are interested in it. I wasn't sure about the logistics part when you told me that actually I should not focus on how to build a startup and how this journey was. Obviously, you can ask me any questions about that in the end. Um, so I was a bit surprised that this was actually in demand, but I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, I'll focus today a little bit on the business model introduction of Lizara and then tell you more about logistics, supply chain, operations, whatever you want to call it, and how this plays a big, major role for us. Um, first of all, I have to start with that. What's the vision of Lizara? We want to create a world that's more fashionable for everyone. Um, that doesn't sound, for example, if you hear it for the first time, like, okay, um, doesn't sound like groundbreaking, but it actually entails a lot of different things. So for everyone, fashionable world. So we've always been thinking European, for example. We've always been thinking across all customer segments, age groups. Um, so actually, if you want to make this possible, it drastically increases in complexity. <clears throat> so just to remind you of what I just said, briefly, is our background is what I'm going to start with. Um, if this works. There it is. <laughs> it's a bit tired. So this is the founders team. Um, I'm not going into detail again, but um, I know Roman from university, Roman knows Robin from trying to hire him for his first startup, and we all came together in 2013 um, to start a new fashion startup, something that would replicate what we thought was the best fashion model so far in the market and bring it to mobile and e-commerce. Um, since then, we've had a lot of investment rounds because that's actually needed to build something this big in such a short amount of time. And on the right, you see what actually was my past four years and kept me busy um, day and sometimes night. Um, there was a 300% KGAR that we actually achieved in that time, um, which means yearly average growth rate. Um, and um, yeah, it brings a lot of challenges with it. So does the country expansion that you see. So I said, we've been thinking European from the beginning. We thought this is not a model that needs to scale in one market, but actually can scale cross-border, which means that we already started with Germany and then quickly added Austria, Switzerland. Then we decided to add two markets that are very not alike, Italy and Netherlands, to see if our model is very country-specific or not. Both of them worked out, and then actually all the doors were open. You see rapid expansion, and now we're basically in all major countries in Europe and the few ones that are missing are already in our heads. <coughs> what happened besides that? We've won some awards. Um, so just to show you, okay, the KGAR is real. Um, there was actually Gründerszene, there was um, Tech5, there was um, the Deloitte Fast 50. Um, actually, always a rewarding moment for the team, something um, that is for us very important because we want to share also with our team that this success story is real. And if you look at supply chain, last year we decided to just send our model, just a short, brief explanation of our model to some of the competitions there and uh, won quite a few of them um, because we realized that this is actually fueling our business. Oh, there we go. Um, brief business model before we go into the supply chain part of it. Um, usually disruption in any industry um, happens from the top. So if you look at uh, the first uh, companies, and I'm taking out a bit ASOS because it's very, very old for uh, an e-commerce company, but usually the first companies are more in the high price segment. Um, there are several reasons for that. Um, one of the main reasons for that, I think, is also because in logistics, for example, high basket sizes uh, don't make you worry too much about how to ship it, um, where the handling costs go. Oh, there's someone on the door. Um, so if you look at Ux, net a you look at ASOS, and then also Zalando, um, you see how it kind of unfolds from the top. Um, Zalando and ASOS more being category killers, for especially Zalando with shoes in the beginning, and with a huge assortment, 
at, however, full price, um, then you could add to this um, the discounted um, shopping club model, where you have fashion, but again, high price fashion, but discounted to a more reasonable price. But then, if you look at the offline world, most of the people actually don't go to Louis Vuitton, they don't go to Armani, and not so many go anymore to Karstadt. And also, the Esprit and the likes are struggling, and that's been like that for a long time. And actually, the big winners offline are in this space. So H&M, Inditex group with all their brands, bestseller group with all their brands, and that's where actually people go that still walk up and down the shopping street. So we thought in the beginning, why is there nobody replicating this online? Obviously, these companies sell online with more or less intensity, but they're not digital natives, right? So they, they, that's not the core of their business. Their business will always be influenced by their stores. This is at the top of their mind is how to... <laughs> okay, we have some distraction tests here. Um, uh, top of their mind is how to actually um, uh, run their stores and run it as good as possible. Um, on the other hand, on the online space, you had even before Lazara or Boohoo, which is here as an example and which we will see later on quite a few times, we had, let's call it the very low price segment. We had the Chinese sellers. Now, Chinese marketplace models obviously can go to very low prices, very insecure quality. We'll see a bit of that later on when I explain why we do some things the way we do. Um, and they had huge success. I mean, everyone knows about the Alibaba IPO, and everyone has read, I think, or a lot of you at least, about Wish. And so there is a market that's looking for a bargain, a good price. And um, also, what you also have to give these models um, for trendy styles, because in dropship model where you actually sell from the factory, sometimes it's not even produced when it's sold, you can be very much at the pulse of trendiness and fashionability. Um, so then we started Lazara and we thought, okay, we position ourselves in actually the spot where we think also people go in, in the offline space and try to build something up there. We were not alone at that beginning time, we didn't know that. So there is, of course, Montpris from the Otto Group that's been there a while, but there is Boohoo. Um, which you'll see later on, who started in the UK, like many UK retailers, has not really come to the continental Europe um, and um, has rather expanded to US and Australia, but it's doing some things very similar to us and maybe is another proof of our concept that we just didn't know in the beginning. <clears throat> so what's Agile Retail? Why do we call it that way and um, how does it compare to other models? So first of all, our learnings. So when we started this, obviously we had something in mind and we had some fundamental beliefs that would drive us in building this company. And first of all is time to market. That's from fast fashion. Fast fashion was successful because it was able to bring down the time between the inception, the idea or the decision on a product and the actual selling of this product. That allows you for yeah, let, uh, sl uh, shorter cycles um, and allows you to react better to the market. Um, speed, reduced replenishment time, reduces risk. So the faster you can replenish styles that are in trend and are selling well, the less risk you will have because you don't have to, you don't have to commit on big quantities. In the end, any style that you launch, no matter what your cycle time before is, has some risk with it, entailed with it. And if you, can, if you can mitigate that risk by going with a lower quantity because you know you can ramp up this quantity fast, that's actually a big advantage. And quality. I just talk, talked about the Chinese marketplaces. So if you have a quality control in your process, which you don't in dropshipping, and that's also one reason we are not doing this, um, you will always be better in actually ensuring this quality and, and making customers happy um, than someone who doesn't know what's in the box. Other fundamental beliefs, now going from fast fashion to general e-commerce fundamental beliefs and something we saw there. First of all, assortment, width beats depth. So that's, again, a learning we also took from marketplaces. So if you look at Alibaba, one of their success factors is that they can sell basically everything. Obviously, more cross-category than us, but they can have everything listed at any point in time. Of course, also because they have no risk associated with it in terms of, terms of inventory, but it shows that also customers value that. So tastes are different, customers are different, and they value if you have a broad selection. So instead of being mono product or a few products, you actually, especially in fashion where tastes are very diverse, you have to carry a wider inventory, a wider assortment. <coughs> Experience, 
And that's something that is also, now it's actually very clear. In the beginning, it wasn't. Um, I don't have a slide on our mobile share and how it ramped up over the years, but it's been like this for everyone. And already two or three years, you didn't have to be, uh, or you didn't have to use magic to say that someone who doesn't focus on mobile would have a big problem by now already and even more in the future. Because people want to buy on mobile, they will do that. Your traffic will come from mobile no matter what you do. And if your traffic comes from mobile and your mobile website, your app is not there or is not good, you will lose eventually. So that was kind of something like the building block of fundamental beliefs we had in the beginning. Then now turning to supply chain, what does that mean? So the traditional supply chain view was actually always the products sold need to be shipped and they need to be shipped in a cost efficient and relatively time efficient way. Um, that means basically you decide on a product and then you go through this process and try to make it as fast and as cost efficient as possible. Not that bad. On the other hand, you can't really react on anything here in this segment anymore. So if you see supply chain as an enabler, it should enable you to have specific products at a specific time listed because you can move them quickly and you can react flexibly to changes here. So actually supply chain um, starts for all companies at demand planning, but demand planning is very static at many companies. So someone says, okay, we, wa we want to sell so much of this product. This product maybe hasn't even, hasn't even been launched. So how do you know that? You have no, no feedback, no response from a customer. So you're actually starting right here in a static way, and then you're trying to optimize this flow. On the other hand, if you're seeing supply chain as an enabler, the supply chain should actually listen to what's there and then make sure that you get this through this process as fast as possible. So instead of a service, we see supply chain as an enabler. So supply chain is not just the team, for example, in our company where someone says, do it fast, do it cost efficient, but actually always thinks about how can we do it better in the future and how can we enable also other teams to not have to worry so much about it. So the other extreme would be that supply chain tells what's not possible and what can't be launched and what can't be moved, and we try to minimize that. And now the first process, and one of the most important processes on where we, uh, where we do this, is actually the time to market. So the inception, the idea, where, we will see later where that comes from as well, but actually what happens when we know we want to launch a product. So as I said before, cycle times need to be short, and it, they can always be shorter, but ideally, they're so short that you can react in season. So if in the beginning of the summer season, you find out that something is trending, a color, a motive, a style, a cut, and you want to have this product, then the goal is to get this as fast as possible. So supply chain starts at sourcing. Sourcing, again, needs to, after the merchandise selection, and I'll come to that later, go as quickly as possible to the factories. One, this is, not one of the reasons, this is the main reason why we actually chose to found a company, daughter company, and an office, um, launch an office in, in China. Uh, Guangdong, the region where we do that, has a lot of advantages. One of it, the most factories, kind of called the, the um, working bench of the world, and the most factories, and everything integrated in a value chain of fashion. So you can go to a factory there and say, I want a product, at least to a very good factory, I want a product, it looks like this, it should be like that, specify it, and that's what our merchandise team does, and then this factory will be able to quote you very fast how much that it will cost, what changes will have to be made, they will be able to send you a sample in real time because they have studios where they manufacture them, and as soon as you approve the sample, they will be able to start production, and production can be very fast, so if you, if you think about it, it's actually very logical. Although you hear maybe that in the fashion industry, you have to place your order a lot in advance, it has to be a lot of quantities, that doesn't have to be this way. I've, of course, the time to produce a product, to sew and stitching, um, that, that per product, you could, you could estimate that, and then you're like, okay, why do I have to place this X month in advance? Why do I have to actually take huge quantities? That's just because the suppliers either don't value or cannot be flexible. They don't value flexibility or they cannot be flexible. So um, don't value means they want to ensure their capacity is secured over a long 
horizon. They want to know in advance how much you need when and plan their capacity accordingly. And obviously, you'll get a little bit better price, but you will have to live with a long cycle time and we'll hear about that later, not, maybe not such a high fashionability. Um, after we actually start the production, in the meantime, we check the first production samples, see if that is fine. If changes are made, depending on the changes, changes, we maybe don't even ask for a new sample. We just say, okay, this minor detail changes. And then after, um, after we received that sample that we approved, we actually in parallel do the photo shoot. The photo and also the content is created. And by the time it arrives in our warehouse and goes to the quality check, actually we're already ready to sell. So if the quality control is approved, then we're able to sell in as fast as 10 working days, so two weeks. And that's actually a major point in the supply chain which enables us to sell products that others cannot sell because they cannot react so quickly to what is in demand. <coughs> Short illustration. Actually, I don't like that slide because it contains a lot of negative messages, um, but a lot of the old offline industry, but also of the offliners that go online fail to live up to this speed aspect of the business because there are more push models They try to actually get products in the market that they choose and then try to push it in the market and if, if there's no demand that's really tough and especially since the online shift has enabled customers to always get what they want they find it somewhere if you don't have that you'll struggle even more and it's Actually, take Lizara off here, don't look at it, because obviously our growth rate is also that high because we're not at the size of these companies. It's just illustrative on our speed. But if you look at um, the other companies, you will see a clear pattern. You see Boohoo right here, you see ASOS, you see Inditex from the offliners, and you'll see some companies that's very UK-focused, obviously, that are more traditional retail, Marks & Spencer, Ted Baker, who take a long time to run a collection, and they're actually struggling to grow. So it kind of exemplifies how important this time to market is. Now more about Lazara's supply chain and what we actually achieve. Lead time, time to market, and we benchmark here against fast fashion. I read before benchmark is for losers here, <laughs> and then I was like, oh shit. Um, but um, let's do it anyways. <laughs> um, let's do it anyways, let's have a look. Um, so I just said Lazara, two to three weeks, that's for all of our assortments. So actually everything, and I won't say that's like for 100%, there will always be edge cases, sampling doesn't go right, quality control fails, and there may be one or two product types that take a bit longer time, but this is basically our fashion assortment is going that fast to the market. Then looking at Boohoo, and they have a bit of a different strategy, so they produce some stuff on site in UK and some stuff in China, and you can see that already part of the assortment really, really fast, another part still very fast compared to the other traditional fast fashion players. Um, then you look at Inditex, the undisputed winner offline, um, and you see three to five weeks, very good, especially if you consider that they have to distribute all of this to stores, and they do also an internal testing, so they don't just run a product without having checked it in some of the representative stores. And then you see some part of the assortment takes already much longer. And if you look at H&M, which has lost a lot of market cap recently and has struggled a lot, although their model has been top-notch for a long time, you can see that 20% comes in eight to 12 weeks, still fast fashion, still faster than we saw Marks and & Spencer and Ted Baker, but actually 80% of the assortment is decided upon very long time before. So this is more the classical buying, so where you see people on, on, on trade fairs saying, okay, what's in the new winter season? Probably already now. And they have to make their bets now. And this is obviously um, a very different approach, which we see here. So going from bottom to top, H&M, that's definitely, at least for these 80%, a push approach. So they decide on what they think fashion will be next winter season, and then they will make sure that this gets produced at good costs, probably not everything in China. Um, and then they'll try to push that fashion into the market. And they do a very good job at it. They do very good branding, they have great campaigns, and definitely in this benchmark, it might not look that way, but there are a lot of retail companies that do a worse job than H&M. Zara Inditex is already a bit of a different approach. As I said before, they have a bit of a pull model because they try new styles. So they put them 
in the stores, they distribute them, they check the response, and then they check in where they go deeper. They already do, uh, do some onshoring or nearshoring production as well to even increase their speed because obviously when they find something that works well in the stores, they want to also go deeper. So that's for the offline. I think that's how far it can go. Then you already have Boohoo, which is only doing online. And you see Boohoo is actually a different model. It's a test and repeat model. So they put on products and if the product doesn't work, then they let it disappear, fade out, whatever. Um, and if it works, they go deeper because they have this capability of going deeper because of the short cycle time. And this is exactly what we try to do as well. So we put on products every day, and we'll see that later. Um, and we check the response and we have so much data about it that we don't need to guess anymore. And we have the cycle time to be able to react on what we see and not what we believe. Pre-season commitment is just another KPI XGD exemplifying this. So the lower your cycle time is, the lower your pre-season commitment is. Why do we still have a pre-season commitment? You could say you don't need any pre-season commitment. You could start summer season and just react on what you see. The thing is, if we would do that extreme and not take any, let's say, initial pre-season commitment, then we would have an empty assortment when uh, summer season starts, and that's not possible. So we do have a stronger ramp up of products in the beginning of the season just to be able to take more out of the eventual success, if there is success, from the product. And this is one of my favorite slides. It's actually a fashion fight of the decade. So that's him. You know him. Versus whom? Him. Data. Him, if you want to. So wh why do I show this? Because I talked about believing and knowing before and or seeing. And actually, Karl Lagerfeld, again, great job. High fashion, also very different industry, because there you have to place your bets. Um, but he's actually, he's placing his bets in a very different way than we would do it or other companies do it. So he's actually finding the products and styles he loves. He's maybe talking to his muse, whoever that currently is, and um, checking in whether that's right. And then in the end, he comes up with a product and says, I love this product. I want this product in my collection. And it's going to launch. And a lot of people are going to buy it, especially because he says he loves it. So it's a very different industry. And if it doesn't sell, he risks on sitting on a lot of overstock. But he doesn't care, because what he sells, he sells at such a high price point that this accommodates the overstock. And in the example of Louis Vuitton, if you want to keep your high price points and your branding, maybe you even have to burn your overstock. We don't burn our overstock. We actually do a data-driven approach. So as I just said, we launch the product, and then we look at the data. We see what we, what we can take from, from the possibilities of E and M commerce, which is basically a short, in a short amount, amount of time, we can actually extrapolate a lot from the demand factors that other people are guessing. So we see how much traffic was on the site, how did it convert, how many people put it in the cart. Um, so we see a lot of this behavior. We see which color works. So why would we want to go deep into a color of a product that is not in demand? An average product might have three or five colors, but maybe only one is actually in demand. Why would you want to ramp up all of them? Then, based on that, we forecast the future demand. And I'm Definitely not saying we're at the end of this. This is the eternal thing. That's something uh, I could spend my lifetime with my teams on doing, because you can always be better in that. Um, and that results in optimal quantities ordered at the right time. So we want to order optimal quantities in high frequency instead of placing one bet. Even if we know already the initial data, it doesn't tell you how long, for example, the trend is going to be. So we try to react in real time. Top sellers, we want to have never out of stock. So if we start with a product and might have 120 pieces, if that product runs well and runs well for a longer time, we're able to sell it 500,000 times. And that's the beauty of it. And at the same time, because we try to get better and better in forecasting future demand, we can avoid overstocks. Because that's something that costs you in the long run more money um, than, for example, lower production costs because you order 5,000. And again, that's him. Now, Another example of data, and I want to have a little quiz. So I'll just exemplify there are more aspects to data and more aspects to this than just forecasting demand or just exploiting a short cycle time. 
That's the same product. Three photos. We photo shoot in-house, so we can actually do different photo shoots, different models. This is not high quality, imagine it would be. Who thinks that this photo is the best? Nobody. Who thinks that this photo is the best? Yeah, a lot, I think. It's already majority. And this one. Okay, so actually, the good thing is if you can if you have a content production in-house and you can shoot in-house, you can not only test products, you can test photos of the product. Because online, you sell just as much the photo as the product. If the photo is looking different than the product, you probably get a return, so you shouldn't mess with that. But you will have to find the right pose for different product types. It, I, I think it's a bit over the top if you say we do this for every product, but we do it for product types and the right styles, and you have to be better in photo shooting. So here, She's like putting it in front of her face, and you would maybe not think it, but that one performed by this percentage better than the others, more than 5,000% better. Just for a photo where before you might, going back, you might have thought it's even covering a little bit of her face, you can't see the model properly, but this pose apparently for this product made people feel better about it. Maybe because they imagine being in the cold and putting it in front of their face. So actually another example, and I won't go deeper into that, on what you can do with testing, testing and repeating. Going back to benchmarks, for me, lo loser. <laughs> um, being able to put products on the site at very low risk doesn't give you only the possibility to have um, uh, to kind of minimize your risk in failing because you can you can you have a short cycle time, but also to broaden your selection. As I said with beat depth, with beat depth, it's very difficult for German, um, and you can see that here on the benchmark of what actually is online on the giants from the offline world, and kind of the newcomers. So, Inditex, I think that's like six thousand, H and M similar. That's the amount of styles they have on offer online at one point in time. And you can already see the difference between H&M and Inditex because H&M doesn't even go to double that number over the course of the year. Inditex more than doubles it. Now you look at Boohoo, you can already see, I like that company. And Boohoo is actually more than doubling on a very high scale, their assortment. So that means products come in, products go out, and they're always able um, to change their assortment, cycle through it. And you already see that we try to go the same path, and we are at the same point in time comparable from the width of the selection. But the cycling, and I, I, I think that's something we're working on, we don't push out products. We don't discount so much. That is something you see on the, uh, on the upper right chart. You see that most of our products we actually sell at full price. And that is where you recover the margin that you think you've lost because you didn't go into big batch production in Bangladesh. So that's where you actually recover it. And that's where, for, ex where, for example, H&M loses it. Daily, um, we did this from the start where we didn't know where to get the products from and I had to stand in the garden and pretend to be a model. C cut off my face so no one could see I'm the founder. Um, and we put on products daily because there was one person in the beginning saying, if my offline store could refurbish the shop window every day, and obviously it's not economically feasible, that would be so good because people passing by would always have a look. And that's what we try to do. So we launch new products every day. So someone who has the desire to come out to our website every day would never be bored and say, oh, I've seen this before. And obviously that's also a result of such a quick cycle time in the supply chain. Inventory turnover. I think that's about it with the benchmarks. Um, inventory turnover in the end means, I think, a lot for a startup, a lot for every uh, company, but uh, even more for a startup because we work with limited resources. Our money that we got from our investors, and we're glad we received it, we don't want to spend or we don't want to put into inventory, especially if it doesn't turn. And if our inventory turnover was not good or that good, then something in the model that I just described wouldn't work. So our goal, and I think we're not at our goal yet, but our goal is to turn our inventory so quickly that it kind of reaches to our cycle time. 
So it's not there yet, otherwise it would be at 24 in our ideal cycle time, but you can already see it's getting there. And you can already see that again, our kind of similar model company is at an even little bit higher rate. And that enables you to actually finance your growth in the end from working capital as well, and not only from venture capital. S going back from benchmarks and, um, and, and, and KPIs, a bit to how can you build something like this and what's important when you build something like this in such a short amount of time to be able to not run against the wall. And I've been asked that a lot of times. I think in the first investor board meetings, the question to me was always, when is our first operational standstill? When will nothing work anymore and uh, grow slow because uh, uh, the supply chain is not able to accommodate this anymore? Well, you have to move very quickly because that's how we moved in growth and that's how we move in the whole supply chain. So if something needs to be done and something has to be achieved, you usually don't have a lot amount of time. And just exemplifying what we did from idea to finalization, that was a crazy time. We actually said we want to launch Lizawa and um, only a few weeks later, we were online with products we bought in big bags. A website I was drastically ashamed of and my Parents always put small messages when I came for dinner and I said, okay, consulting is hiring because I used to be a consultant before. And, um, and I was really feeling the pressure, but that's something that actually made us move that quickly because if you don't have this pressure and if you're over conceptualizing and you sit there for six months and you think this could be a good opportunity, 100% sure someone has done it or the opportunity wasn't that good. Same for first internationalization. So we thought, and that's actually, um, I think that was Switzerland, even with a customs border. So we thought, okay, we need, to, we need to actually build something to scale this also abroad because this model is working well, so why not go into the next country? And we said that and we said, okay, let's do it. And five weeks later, we went live. And I think one of the biggest projects, because it involves also physical assets, is our Chinese warehouse. Um, when we said, okay, we need to have a warehouse there, we need to store the goods there, we need to be able to check the goods there. Um, that took us eight weeks. And I won't, I, I, I won't uh, and neglect, it was also because of a great logistics partner there. In China, everyone has this mentality, I sometimes feel. Um, and that actually helped us to reach our goals. And that's actually also exemplified in our value, no to limits, yes to opportunities. Um, something that I think applies also to everyone. A lot of you raised their hands when the question was, are you entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs? That's a good, good value to add. Oh, I'm running out of battery. Okay, that's pressure's on. But I already had to wrap up. No, it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. Um, next project, I just said, we like these projects, ambitious projects, and, and, and something that actually always makes us do something new, take the next step. It's our warehouse in Erfurt. Um, we're currently constructing it. This is fresh from the visit. Um, you already see the Zara branded doors, and this is how it will look like in the end. And a lot of excited people are working on making this happen and actually also welcoming a lot of new employees in the Lazara family, um, something we're very much looking forward. I won't tell you this is eight weeks or something. Don't worry. <laughs> the construction takes the time. All in all, wrapping up, um, and I won't read them all out, I think, um, we're not only confident that this is a great model and we actually chose the right model, but we're super happy building it. It's so much fun. When you, when you see that, that the model, the concept, can be fueled with a lot of great people working on it, can be constantly expanded, can always take the next step, and you have something like a fundamental belief under it that you can always go back to when you have to make a decision. Um, we always um, put this slide in at the end because we say, okay, this is kind of the five things um, that we always believe in. Quality control is in there. Um, scale direct sourcing models. We're super happy we went to China. We're super happy we're working directly with factories and with the people who make the fashion and it's not a black box for us. Um, customer satisfaction. Um, so that's a core question you have to ask yourself in the beginning. Do you want to scale something that actually um, only goes via price? And we had this discussion in the beginning or something that actually tries to wow customers as well. Um, and all these fundamental beliefs, they follow us until today and actually make it so much fun to work in supply chain operations at Lizar. And that's it.
Feel like I'm in it. Feel like I'm in it.